What's up, everybody? Big Herc 916, getting down with Fresh Out. You know how we do it over here. Got a special guest today. Got my man Ramon, formerly known as the modern day caveman. And man, he's got a hell of a story. He spent 31 years behind bars between the feds and the state system. So you can learn a lot from watching this video. So Ramon, tell the people um, about you know where you're from and how you grew up. Well, I'm from a I'm I'm really from Akron, Ohio, but and and uh, about seventh grade we moved to Alliance, Ohio, and like my family is pretty much. Like my dad left when I was like five years old. He wanted my mom to be a hoe and he was a pimp. And she was like, dude, you out your mind. And so we left and packed up and moved off. And um, and about I said, well, I started wrestling when I was in second grade. I think I was in like second grade, I was like eight years old. And um, I ended up winning like second in the city, and I kind of Flash forward, I never wrestled again until pretty much my seventh grade, eighth grade year when, I, when we moved to Alliance. And we had, we kind of jumped around. My, you know, my mom, was, we were poor, I had a single mom. We was on welfare, living in uh, public housing and and uh, metropolitan housing and subsidized housing. It was like, like rats and roaches was my friends. <laughs> and um, we ended up coming to Alliance in seventh grade. And then and I started eighth grade I was playing I started playing basketball and I saw these guys running around the top of the gym at basketball practice I was like yo who was those guys and they were like oh that's the wrestling team and I was like wrestling and you know I know I was pretty good at wrestling when I was young and I still you know I was like I think I could do that so after wrestling I mean after basketball practice I went up to the uh wrestling mat you know the guys the coaches saw me wrestling and I mean saw me watching and they was like, well, who, like, who are you? You know, and I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I just got here. And they was like, you think you know how to wrestle? And I was like, I, I think I can hang. So they was like, yo, Matthew, give him a try. Like they looked, you know, and I was like, all right, I went out there and I gave dude the business. And they was like, oh, okay. So um, started wrestling from there. Then my, my freshman year, I was undefeated. Then I just... Long story short, I ended up being a wrestling star. I, I was like, I went to state, I placed at state. I was, I was absolute dog at wrestling. So when I graduated from high school, um, I didn't want to go and I didn't want to do any more school, right? I just didn't want to do any more school. I was done with it because I barely graduated. I did graduate, but it wasn't from like being stupid or anything. It was just from lack of effort. I just like, I, did put an effort forward. I did graduate, but I had to like really study and get my grip. My uh, I had to pass my final exam, and I had decided to join the, the the military. I was all my uncles were military. They all had groomed me to be military, so I was ready to go into the service. And I had got into this program called the delayed entry program, and I was going to the army, and I was going to be an electrical guidance for no it was a Persian missile electrical guidance specialist. That was my job. And I was also going to wrestle. They had paid, they was going to pay me to wrestle for the army. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Go see the world, you know, kick it, learn to get some training, be cool. And um, the weekend before my departure date, which my, my ship date was supposed to be January the 4th, 1989. Well, December 29th was, was my, uh, me, oh, December 29th, me, and my coach's son and his best friend, we decided that we were going to go out and go celebrate that this was my last weekend in town. And I was going to, um, you know, I was just, we were just going to go out and kick it. And that's, that's pretty much was, that was the, the catalyst of everything is like me going out that night, going out to a white bar and, um, man. So if you remember, like in 1988, 1989, rap was big. Like everybody wanted to be a rapper. Everybody was rapping. I thought I was Rakim, <laughs> a cross between Rakim and Kumo D. And uh, so we went to this 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 bar, this white bar in the, in in Alliance, Ohio. 
And I got on stage. They had a live band that night. I got up on stage and I asked them if I could come up and rap. And they was like, yeah. So I got up there and I was rapping. And while I looked out in the crowd, the t and by the way, the two guys that I was with were white. Alliance is pretty much a white town. So it's pretty much um, like 70, 30 white. It's, it's, not, it's not really that many black people in Alliance. And where we do live in Alliance, we're pretty much in, this, in the, in, you know how they got it segregated. <laughs> we live in certain areas. Well, I um looked out at the crowd and I heard Marcus and Joe, they was arguing with some other white dudes and I heard the nigger word, the, 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 the N word. They was like, I was like, man, oh, here we go. And then I kept hearing it getting loud. And then by the time I got closer, I heard, yeah, you, you nigger lovers. I was like, oh, here we go, man. So I, I'm like, Marcus was drunk. Joe was kind of tipsy. I didn't really drink at that time. I was kind of like, like a, I, I might sip a beer at the most. I didn't really drink. And um, so I'm like, I get us and I get us to leave. And we go, we go across the, the hall to, to, uh, well, we go across the street to the gas station. There was a gas station across the street. So when I get in there, I go in there to pay. And when I come out, I see Marcus is surrounded by these four guys and Joe was standing like Joe was standing in the, on the passenger side, but he's standing in, in like in between the door and the car. He's got the, got the passenger door open and he's looking over top of the, the, the roof of the car. And, um, so when I come up, I'm like, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? They was like, yeah, hey, you know, we're going to do this and do that. And I was like, dude, so I, one of them had a nightstick. One of them had a crowbar. One of them had an aluminum baseball bat. The other one had a Louisville slugger. And I was like, oh, man. Now, I got to back up. I got to back up. I got to back up. About two weeks prior to this, I was out at my grandparents' house. And, we, and, and my grandparents, they live out in the country, so it's real rural. And I was just being a nosy kid, really. I was young, just being nosy. I, don't even, I didn't even remember what I was looking for, but I was snooping through the drawers. And I came across a, a Smith & Wesson 38 Special. Call it a Saturday night special. And uh, I was like, oh, this is cool, man. You know, I was like, yeah. So wait till the dudes like they see this. And it wasn't like I was on some gangster stuff, man. I wasn't even a gangster. I was really pretty much a square. But I was like, it was like, you know, it was at that time of the year. People was like, it was kind of, kind of cool. It's just, it was, I don't know. I, I don't know why I took it, but I took it. And that night I had the gun in the glove compartment and I had the bullets in my chest pocket. Right in my in my jean jacket pocket, and um, I remember like we was arguing, and the next thing you know, they hit Marcus in the knee with the crowbar. I'm like, oh, Joe runs, and then now I'm faced with these four guys, and they all got weapons on. So we just start we started scrapping, and I don't know if you can see, but can you see this scar going across my lip? I got 37 stitches going across my lip from the crowbar. They hit me in the, in the face with the crowbar. They actually held me hit me forward and smacked me in the face with the crowbar. And I kind of like stood up. I saw white. Like I thought I was going to pass out. And I knew if I passed out that they was going to kill me. Then I ended up with, I had 37 stitches here, 18 stitches here, 12 stitches here, three broken ribs, two broken fingers, and, and like just multiple scratches and abrasions. Well, I managed to get in the car. I jumped in the driver's side. We had a big Lincoln. It was like a 1980 Lincoln Continental. It was big old green. Like it was green. Big old Lincoln. And I remember jumping in the driver's seat and I shut the door, locked the doors, and they busted out the window. And I climbed over, grabbed the gun. I got the gun, but it was empty. Remember, it was empty. So I, I jumped out the passenger side. And by the time I got out the passenger side, they was already there. They was on me. I was trying to get the gun loaded. Remember, I had two broken fingers. Like, these two fingers were broken. So I'm trying to get into my pocket, get the bullets out, and I managed to get two bullets out. And um, I, I, I got them in the gun side by side, and I, sh I clicked the gun shut, and I turned around, and I aimed at dude's face and pulled the trigger. It just clicked. And um, I was like, oh, man. And they was like, oh, he's got a little cap gun. <laughs> yeah, look at that. He's got a little, little gun. And, and, you know, they hit me some more. and. I aimed at his chest, pulled the trigger, and it clicked again. And I was like, man, this is going to be a problem. Like, and they was just beating on me. Like, this whole time, they're beating me. And I'm trying, I'm running around trying to get get away. 
And then the third time I, I aimed at him again, I was like, click. And it just clicked. I was like, dang. But now I know that I got two bullets side by side because I know I can only, it only holds five bullets. And I've already clicked it three times. So I looked at him. I was like, hey, man, please don't make me shoot you, man. Just let me go. And he grabbed me by my shirt and he reached back to punch me again. And I turned my head and I aimed down at his legs. And I was like, kind of like this. And I pulled the trigger. And when the gun went off, he flipped. Like his leg shot out from behind him. Like shot back and he fell to the ground and his partners, everybody froze. And it was like, and they was like, oh, it's a real gun. And they took off running one way. No, I take that back. Hold on. I fired that warning shot in the air. I, I knew I, I'm, I take, I'm sorry. I, I fired the first shot. I was like, hey, please don't make me shoot you. And he was like, yeah. And I put the gun in the air and I pulled the trigger. And they were like, oh, it's a cap gun. It's a starter gun. That's what they said. It's a starter pistol. And I was like, man. So I was like, dude, so that's when I reached, like when he grabbed me, I turned, I reached, I turned my head, I, I aimed at his leg and I pulled the trigger and he fell. And they, everybody froze at that point, like, because they realized it was gun, it, the gun was real. And they took off one, in, one way and I took off one in the other. And I was like trying to get to the hospital because the hospital was like a block over. And um, I heard the police behind me, he's like, stop, 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 or we'll shoot, stop, police, stop, police. I'm like, okay, so I stop, I turn around, I look, I see the flashing lights, I see the, you know, they got their flashlights out, the headlights, and I'm like, I'm beat up, man, I'm beat up bad. And uh, I ended up walking towards him, and when the police saw me coming, like, I can see that when he, when he saw my face, he was like, kind of like, Ugh, you know, like, he was like, wow, like, it was, you can see that he, it was something wrong with my face by the look on his face. And then... I passed out. I remember saying like they tried to kill me and I passed out. When I woke up, I was in the hospital and I, I was handcuffed to a bed. And they was talking, the doctor was talking about, they had to call a plastic surgeon in to stitch my mouth. And I was like, dude, I was hurting bad. I was I was in serious pain. I couldn't hardly breathe. Like my whole head felt like a balloon that's just ready to pop. And um, the police kept saying like, well, we just need to transfer him. Like, we, we just let us know when we can move him. So eventually, after like a long time, they ended up um, taking me downtown. And when they got me downtown, they took me in this room and they had this table laid out and they had all the weapons laid out on the table. And they asked me, do you recognize any of this? And I was like, yeah, that's that's the, the, the stuff that we that we was fighting with. I said, that's my grandfather's gun right there that I shot him with. He was like, oh, so you admit shooting him? And I was like, yeah, I shot him, man. And he was like, okay, um. Uh, you're going to be charged with felonious assault. We're going to take you to the county jail. You want to call somebody? And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, you're, we're going to transport you to county jail. Uh, I was like, what? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you, you know, and I was like, okay, um, yeah, I got to call my mom. So it's probably like three, four o'clock in the morning now. So I know she's wondering where I'm at because I'm not, I don't really stay out all night. I'm really, I'm even though I'm 18, I'm still not allowed to stay out all night because I live at home. And um, so I called my mom and like, she's, she's like, hello. And I'm like, mom, I, I'm, 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 I'm downtown. I'm, I'm at the city jail. They're getting ready to transfer in East Star County. And I shot somebody and she was like, whoa. What? And she was like, wait a minute. What? What? It's like, you, you shot somebody. You shot somebody. You sh Where'd you get a gun from? And I was like, from, from, from granddad. And she was like, you stole a big house gun. She was like, oh man. Oh my God. She was like, oh, she, and so she was more worried about my grandfather. My grandfather was a mean dude, but she was worried that, that I took his gun because we was going to have to answer for that. But she was like, okay, you, you, you're downtown. Like, you know, okay. She was like, well, just hold on. We'll, 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 we'll figure something out. We'll, we'll, we'll come see you. We'll, you know, just call me when you can. And I was like, all right. And they transported me to the county jail. And I could, I was so beat up that they couldn't even put me in the general population. I had to go to the medical, like the medical isolation is what they called it. And I, I couldn't eat. I couldn't even open my mouth. I was like, they had to feed me through a straw. I had to eat liquid straw because my, my mouth and my face was so swollen. It was, like, it was just messed up, man. And then my mom and them, they came and saw me. She she said, we got a lawyer for you. Like, we're trying to get your bond together. And uh, she brought me a couple books, man. She she brought me a couple books. She brought me um 
uh, it was two books. The first one was the autobiography of Malcolm X, and the second one was Free at Last. And that's how I pretty much got in trouble for the first time, man, and got, got caught up in the criminal justice system. Did those other guys get charged with anything for the assault? Absolutely not. I was the only one that got charged. What about the two guys that were with you? Did they come and say anything on your behalf, or were they? Cause they got one of the guys got you know broken knee, and the other guy took off. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So okay. So during this process, let me, I guess I can go on to this. So now I'm out, I ended up getting out on bond. Um, of course, I can't get a job now. I can't go to the service. My recruiter is tripping because he was like, "Dude, you can't go to the service with a with a felony." Like you, you not with this type of felony, man. He said, you need to try to get non-restrictive probation. So the prosecution, they kept offering these deals. At first it was like eight to 25, then it was five to 25, then it was three to 15. And like, they just kept coming with these deals throughout this whole thing. And, and throughout the process, our lawyer, my lawyer that we hired, we got a paid attorney. He's probably the best attorney in Alliance at this time. And he was like, oh, this is clear self-defense. Like we can beat this. Like, yeah. And so we gave him the retainer money and he did and during his invest his, his investigation. He had got statements from Marcus. He got statements from Joe, the two guys that ran. And they were saying that these guys jumped me. They said we had an altercation, um, a verbal altercation at the, the beer house, which was the name of the place that we were at. And we left there came to the gas station. I went inside to pay when I came out. That's when the, the major thing happened. They had the 911 tape from the clerk at the gas station. They had that tape and she was screaming like, you got to get out of here. Get out of here. They're trying to kill him. Better hurry up. Get here, please. This help send help. They're trying to kill him. So I heard that tape and I'm like, yeah, it's self-defense all day. And so, um, th yeah, everybody was willing to, 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 to testify to what had happened, but nobody else got charged. I was the only one that was facing charges, period, period. Like nobody else at all got charged. And so what ended up happening was after like, like I was fighting this case for like 21 months and we finally got to the trial date, right? And I'm getting ready to go to trial. We're actually showed up for trial. I'm in trial. And actually... I started selling, let me back up a little bit. I started selling drugs. That's when, you know, in 88, 89, the 90, and that's when drugs hit Alliance. Let me just say that. I don't know when it hit everybody else. I'm just telling you when it got big, crack hit Alliance. And and, every, and I'm seeing everybody, not everybody, but dudes is coming up. And I'm like, shoot, I can do that. And my mom's, she was like, she didn't really want me to do it because she was like, if I want you to sell drugs, I'd have you selling for me like forever, you know, like before. But I wanted to get out. I was like, I, I, I didn't want to be a burden and I, I wanted my own money. So I started selling dope. And like my mom realized that I was going to start doing it. She sat me down and was like, listen, all right, if you're going to be selling drugs, let me let me tell you the rule. So she gave me, she gave, you know, my mom gave me the game. <laughs> That's crazy. But um, so I ended up taking this plea deal because my lawyer comes to me and he goes, look, Ramon, he says, I'm going to tell you the truth, man. He said, you're a black man in a white town. You shot a white man with a stolen gun. You're not going to get a jury of your peers. So you're taking a risk if you take this to trial, man. He says, because Ohio really doesn't have a self-defense law. And at that time, we didn't have a self-defense law. Like the, 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 their idea was you had to be like in a room locked up and there's only one way to get out and you had to go through them to get out. If you could run and get away from anywhere else, there was no such thing as self-defense. And so he was like, listen, man, he said, this is what they're doing. He said, they're going to throw the gun out of the case. Just get rid of the gun, period. And then charge you with aggravated assault. So they're going to drop it from a second degree felony to a fourth degree felony. They're going to sentence you to 18 months to five years, but they're going to guarantee you 30 day shock probation. And I was like, what does that mean? He says, you got to go to prison, get a number, come out and you'll be on five years probation. And I said, I said, what do you mean? Go to prison, get a number. And he was like, you just got to go to prison. All you, all they want you to do is go get the number. When you get the number, they'll process you. You come back out on five years probation. He said, it takes about, it's like a 90 day process. Did the recruiter, have a role in any of this? Could he have came forward and said anything to help you out or anything? Well, only thing that he was willing to say was that I was that I was listed, that I was 
willing to go to the service. That's the only thing he could, like, he didn't have no say so. So they pretty much, like, I looked at, I looked at my mom. I was like, what should I do? And she was like, you a grown man. You know, this is your life. You make the decision. You know, and, and looking back now, I wish I would have took it to trial. I should have because it was clear. But my lawyer was telling me that I, I, I would get credit for all the time that I served. And, like, I would, I'm just going to, like, it's only going to be, like, a couple months. I was already in, I had already been in the county jail for 11 months for getting caught up with, 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 I'm not, excuse me, for nine months. I was in the, I was in the county jail for nine months for driving with no operator's license and they had revoked my bond. And so, um, I just, I was like, man, See, that's I crazy. took the deal. That, you yeah. know, the fact that they had, I mean, I know they sh probably had pictures of the damage these guys did to you in, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. that attorney to take your money and then at the end of the thing, tell you to take a deal. It's like, you know, obviously they had beat the, you know, beat the, the you know, try to beat the brakes off you, beat the other guy up. You know, he was he was hurt. So there was an assault there. But I mean, that just tells you how messed up the system is, man. Yeah, man. And I, that was my introduction to the system. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so from that point forward, I like and, and needless to say, um, I was angry. I was an angry black man at that point.